Oh man, crypto, crypto, crypto. <laughs> um, we've gotten a lot of requests uh, from yeah. crypto uh, firms to have us work with them in some way, shape or form. And I think crypto has a lot of different shades, right? You have the DeFi side, you have the real world asset side, you have um, sort of the staking, uh, I guess it's part of like DeFi as well. Uh, but it's just a, a hodgepodge of everything. And I think what's been interesting to watch is that a lot of these companies are trying to learn and speed run through financial markets and financial market history that has taken like several hundreds of thousands of years to create. They're kind of just doing it in two months, three months time. And they're seeing the, the, the blowback as well coming from that. Let's talk a bit about private debt. I, I'm personally born and raised in, in public debt, so traded bonds, et cetera, right? Uh, but um, it, let's introduce it a bit to our audience, this, um, this asset class private debt. How would you define it? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. It actually powers so much of the global economy. You just don't really recognize it. And I think it really had its moment after the global financial crisis. So rewind back to 2009 when I just graduated college. Uh, and uh, they were essentially a time where the banks really took a step back from conventional lending, lending to small businesses, lending to consumers. And really, a lot of that was down to the regulatory requirements around capital reserves they had to hold in order to make those type of loans. So by taking a step back, you had this huge gap in the market where other people had to fill, right? Clearly, businesses still needed loans. Consumers still needed loans. And so where was it going to come from? It was going to come from these non-bank lenders. And non-bank lenders are the ones who are essentially, you know, in the name itself, not a bank. They don't have a balance sheet. And so they actually have to source a uh, warehouse facility or, or credit facility from somewhere else to be able to finance the growth of their business. And so throughout, I would say, 09 till even very recently, private debt has just been absolutely booming because they've been filling the gap that the banks left behind. And VCs have been powering that as well. Now, when you see the likes of like buy now, pay later, when you see the likes of revenue advances or factoring receivables or things like that, that have driven a lot of VC interest, um, that is really what makes up private credit. So it powers so much of what goes on on a day to day life. You just don't even realize it. Yeah, that's that's uh, absolutely true. Uh, if we look at this asset class uh, size wise, how big of an asset class is it compared to other asset classes? So you're on the public debt side, so I can use that as yeah. a comp. Uh, public yeah. debt markets are about $52 trillion, and there's about a $9.5 trillion credit default swap market underpinning that as well. Um, private debt is actually only $7 trillion. And so without anything of the efficiencies that public debt markets have, they've still been able to grow to about $7 trillion. So that makes, that's comprised of a lot of different types of sub-asset classes within private debt. Um, some of them could be what's called structured finance. And so that is almost like a securitization, essentially. There's public market securitizations, which I'm sure you were involved in, and there's private market securitizations as well. Uh, then there's really just conventional lending to these businesses, like middle market lending, bank commercial lending. And then there's a very large US private placement market um, that essentially drives uh, a lot of these kind of bigger ticket transactions as well. You know, so those are kind of what makes up the seven trillion uh, in a nutshell. Yeah. So if we become very concrete, what kind of projects can you fund via the percent platform, for example? Yeah, we cover a lot of ground actually. Mm -hmm. um, so we have small business lenders on our website. And so investors have the ability to get exposure to loans to small businesses, uh, not just in the United States, but also in Latin America, in Europe, in Africa. Uh, we also have consumer loans. And so consumer loans range from uh, earned wage advances to just general consumer loans uh, not in the United States. Uh, you have factoring of invoices. So being able to essentially um, take an invoice as collateral and be able to advance them a certain percentage of that. Uh, there's a whole subsector of private debt called litigation finance, where they're essentially um, providing financing to, uh, for settlements and things like that, or at least to go through litigation, depending on where you run the life cycle. There's equipment leasing, uh, whether it's a crypto mining rig, which was you know, really well and good maybe about four or five months ago and not so much right now. Uh, but there's also just conventional machinery and equipment leasing on that side as well. So it is covering so many different sub asset classes within the economy uh, that everyone is probably semi familiar with at the very least. Yeah. Um, which kind of uh, which of these pockets are growing the most, would you say? So it's interesting. We've been around for four years and we've seen a lot of shift uh, and changing over time. And it almost is uh, directly tied to sort of sentiment around the economy. 
Um, so I can kind of rewind back a little bit to COVID times. Uh, when we were all stuck at home, e-commerce was all the rage, right? And so literally e-commerce financing and almost like, and mobile apps too, because everyone was on their phone, mobile app financing just absolutely blew up. There was so much demand for it and people couldn't even get enough money for just holding the inventory to be able to do these types of, of uh, sales and, and, and uh, for the merchants. Uh, as that evolved, or we, you know, the market picked up steam again. We came back outside. Um, COVID subsided. Uh, small business lending started to take off as well, right? Because businesses need to get back to to back in shape and back to normal and start operating again. And then now we're seeing a stage where you know consumers, because of where things are at and sort of the situation with the market, uh, they're a little bit tight, right? So they also need loans as well. So it is extremely cyclical. There are a lot of macro uh, headwinds and tailwinds that drive interest and demand in the private debt space uh, that makes for a very interesting and fascinating opportunity to watch, especially since we have such good visibility into the underlying performance of these borrowers. Yeah. Uh, who, who are the typical uh, buyers of these products? I mean, uh, when I um, look around the public debt markets, uh, we obviously have big institutions buying a lot of the bonds, right? Would such institutions be involved in the private debt space as well? Yeah, public debt is so much simpler. Uh, there's you yeah. know market standards in place. You have ratings yeah. agencies that tell you whether it's investment grade or high yield. You have data standards in place because uh, there's required reporting from the SEC and audited financials. And you kind of know who's there, right? You have public companies who need debt, investment banks who structure it, and these institutional investors, like you mentioned, who are investing in these products. On the private debt side, uh, these small transactions could be as small as 50 grand. And the large transactions could be as large as 250 million. And so when there's a, such a wide spectrum, it's a very different and diverse set of audience as well. Uh, so on the investor side, you're going to see on the 50 grand side to you know, even 1 million side, those are going to be your accredited investors. Uh, those are going to be people who are high net worth individuals looking to diversify their portfolio, looking to find alternative uh, areas of return, in which case you know, private debt has done very well in this market downturn. Uh, you have family offices and credit funds who are looking to get exposure and diversify their portfolio as well. And then you have institutional investors, which are multi-billion dollar, multi-strategy credit funds who have this, uh, this is their asset class, right? This is what they focus on. Uh, and they put hundreds of millions of dollars to work per, per transaction to be able to make it all go. Uh, so it is a very diverse array of audiences here looking for this type of paper. Let's dig a bit into the performance of the asset class this year. Um, we all know that it's been a tough year, uh, basically across almost uh, every single asset out there. If we look at public debt, um, it's almost impossible to find a bond performing this year. Uh, what about private debt? Yeah, it's actually done quite well, uh, but it very much comes down to the structuring and also to the underlying performance of the asset themselves. And those two almost always go hand in hand. Uh, so I would say, you know, for us in particular, we're we're recording this on July 6, 2022, about halfway through the year. Uh, our weighted average return um, is about 12% annualized. And so we're still tracking to about 6% in interest that we paid out blended uh, over the course of the year, which is much better than probably the, the rest of the market at this point. Um, so that's very comforting. I think the benefit for investors is that they, ha they have the opportunity to actually monitor the performance post-close. And so a big value prop for percent is our ability to actually provide this type of surveillance reporting. Uh, so there are definitely private debt opportunities that have not gone well this year, without a doubt, not on our platform at the very least. Uh, and it really much, very much comes down to the structure and the assets themselves. But if you give investors as many tools as they need to be able to diligence it properly and then monitor it post-close, they can make the best educated decision for themselves. Uh, just to be perfectly upfront, if something's offering 25, 30%, there's probably some risk associated with that that you need to know yeah. walking into it versus something that's offering you know six to seven percent is probably priced in that level of risk as well so investors need to be a little bit smarter about how they want to diversify but in this environment where you're looking for yield and looking for spread above inflation uh, people may go further up the risk curve to be able to do that when, when I buy uh, an investment graded bond, Nelson, um, it's pretty easy for me to mark to market that bond every day because it's usually traded every day, or at least I get a price on the screen, right? How would you assess sort of the running return on private debt? Is it as easy as with public debt? Definitely not as easy because yeah. the, the financials and the reporting is just not nearly as clear, right? Uh, but that's part of what we're trying to change. We're trying to essentially bring public market efficiencies into private debt markets. So all the things that you're used to, whether it's um, standardized deal structures with that almost like rating type mentality associated with it, uh, the standardized reporting for investors to be able to compare, all those things are things that we're trying to bring to the table here. 
Um, so just as an example, because uh, crypto seems to be on the top of everyone's mind right now, given how far the market has fallen, uh, we have a couple of crypto lenders and just issuers on the platform ourselves. Um, and we've been able to see their performance almost in real time, right? Pretty much every day. And so uh, on, on the structuring side of things, we have something called over collateralization requirements, right? Which means that a lender needs to be able to have a certain level of collateral on their balance sheet that's probably higher than what the actual assets are, are worth. Um, and so what's been fascinating to watch, because we have this on a daily basis, uh, is these crypto lenders, whenever Bitcoin crashes, you see them dip very close to that over collateralization minimum that we set for them. And then they margin call their borrowers and then you see the over collateralization rise up again beyond the excess amounts that they need. And so when you look at these reporting, you can pretty much not knowing the price of Bitcoin on February or April or, or June, you'll know when it crashed because you saw the, uh, the over collateralization dip to the minimum level and then they margin called on the way up. This level of transparency is what is almost akin to public debt markets, right? Not exactly, but it's, it's close enough or closer than it's ever been before. Thanks to a lot of things that we're doing on our side. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.